Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Science and the News series brought to you by the Centre for Data Science and the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences. Today, we have a very special presentation on living and working with artificial intelligence. I'm Rubina Xavier. I'm the Vice President of the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic at QUT. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all online today. In commencing today, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on where we're sending this, uh, this webinar today or hosting the webinar and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging of the Turbaral and Yagara people at what we know is a critical point in Indigenous Australian affairs at the moment. This place of the river here in Brisbane has long been a place of learning, teaching and research and QUT is deeply honoured to be able to continue with that tradition. As we know, every day brings news on advances within artificial intelligence and the benefits and challenges, the good news and the bad news and everything that we read in between. And we have an amazing multidisciplinary panel today to explore current thinking and practice in artificial intelligence in the way we do things or will do things and how we'll live and work with artificial intelligence in our everyday lives, including sustainability initiatives, digital identities, creative practice, health and education. Each of our panelists will give a short presentation and then we'll have time for questions at the end. And if we can use the Q&A function um, to put your questions in, so please think ahead of time about what you'd like to ask and we'll make sure we've got time at the end to cover that. So um, to get us started today, I'm going to invite our first speaker, Professor Kaiser Venonen, who's a professor of human technology interaction in Tampere University in Finland. Kaiser has more than 25 years experience of interdisciplinary research, both in industry and the academy. She's currently focusing on human-centered AI and how AI-driven solutions can advance sustainability. She's especially passionate about understanding how user needs and experiences can be supported by novel technologies. Kaiser has been selected as an ACM Distinguished Member for her longstanding contribution to the field of computing. And we're absolutely delighted that she's currently a visiting research fellow at QUT's Digital Media Research Center. So welcome Kaiser to your presentation. Thank you so much, Robina. So let me share my screen and then I will start. Okay, so indeed, thanks for having me here. And um, well, already it was said here that I'm I'm visiting currently QT, so I'm really excited to be here in in um, Brisbane for three months. And so I, I I was thinking that in my my talk here I will be talking a little bit about a little bit about uh, what is human centered AI and why is it important and why is it actually quite hard to design. So. Um, so I'm here focusing on those types of uh, AI solutions that are somehow in in direct in direct interaction with the uh, with the end uh, with the end users. So somehow these AIs are visible to the people because of course there are different AI solutions in the society that kind of are hidden from us. For example, in the factory automation, you will have some optimizing uh, processes and as well as, uh, for example, the traffic light controls in the city. That's not something that the person uh, directly interacts with. So uh, some of the examples of this kind of interactive AI that I'm especially interested in is, is for example, this um, car, uh, uh, autonomous uh, uh, cars and uh, self-driving cars and uh, people's interaction within those, because, of course, they still need to be be in control of the, that driving uh, another example here is uh, this kind of like a mental health uh, chatbots, which are already uh, being taken into use. Another example here is uh, recommendation systems, which of course have been there for a long time already uh, for shopping, uh, media consumption and so on. And then for, for example, this kind of um, uh, medical analytics. So for example, cancer diagnosis and other, other tools like this. So where the user actually has, has a sort of like direct interaction with this AI application. So that's where, because I have the background in human technology interaction. So I naturally then, then look into these, these, um, uh, this perspective of AI. 
So, of course, we have probably all have some experience of, of this failing human uh, AI interaction. So at least we have read about them. So a very simple example to start with is this, for example, Siri or any of these assistants that will will suggest something or ask something, even if you don't expect it to do it. So it can be sometimes very annoying that these, these kind of like... Uh, queries come to you even though you don't expect that at least personally I get uh, quite annoyed every time the Siri suddenly says oh can I do something for you I said no I didn't ask you to do anything for me okay that's still quite har harmless of course then with uh, uh, this generative um, large language model tools uh, there are uh, kind of uh, many of course wonderful and fantastic opportunities but also problems such as these hallucinations that have been talked about a lot and uh, <clears throat> and here of course it's not like the AI is evil or it's somehow intentionally hallucinating. It's just the way it has been developed to kind of uh, produce the outcomes. So, but of course, these these kind of um, these kind of like incorrect uh, answers and uh, incorrect um, uh, responses can still uh, produce uh, harm in in many occasions. Then, in this kind of driving and and kind of traffic context. Um, there have been some um, studies. I don't actually personally study the traffic uh, myself, but of course there are lots of people in the world who do that. And so there are these kind of like um, findings that even though, I mean, of course we can automa automatize this sort of recognition of traffic rules and, and, and signals, but I mean, this human behavior is so nuanced and so complex in traffic that uh, it can be very hard and it is very hard to fully, fully, um, kind of model that into these uh, AI systems. And yet another example, um, well, this kind of smart home context, I found this particular example quite interesting that the person moved to a new house and the system was still kind of like set up for the previous owner or, uh, and, and then he uh, yeah in this person it was a male they had to they had to kind of like uh in a way obey what the ai was expecting them to do so they just kind of gave up in the end and they just went to bed because the ai thought that that, that should be their bedtime mm -hmm. so of course there are many of these failures they sort of are due to unanticipated human behavior but also i mean and mostly they come from this unpredictable reasoning by the ai and and, and again i just want to emphasize that especially in my field we always come uh, start from the assumption that it's never fault of the human user if there is a failure but it's a consequence of somehow uh, for some reason unsuccessful technology development so what what uh, many people now are looking into and and indeed my my team is also looking at this kind of like human centered um uh, ai AI uh, approach where we really try to focus on the very early stages of, of designing AI solutions that the almost uh, focuses on, on human values, needs, their agency, and, and especially or uh, as much as to the individual humans, but also the context of use. So, um, so the idea is that we are not there to replace human intelligence, but, uh, but to, to extend it. Uh, the AI should be controllable, it should be explainable, it should be obviously ethical, unbiased, safe in all its decisions, and it should account for different stakeholder needs. And this is very important because if, even if we just focus on the end users, there are other stakeholders, like in the self-driving car case, there are other passengers, uh, other other drivers, uh, uh, traffic planners, and so on, many other stakeholders. So these, of course, these kind of stakeholder networks can become very, uh, very um, uh, complex. And um, in the end, also, they should provide uh, not just effective outcomes, but also good, uh, positive user experiences. And so what kind of human-centered AI interactions uh, we should def design for? Uh, there are just a few of them here. I won't kind of spend too much time on this, uh, but I mean, uh, AI can be proactive because it can observe and sense the world. It can be adaptive. It can be become personal, uh, very kind of like personalized. It can be collab collaborative, transparent, and fair. And in one word, if I would have to put, pick one word, uh, how how we should design the AI to be, it would be trustworthy. Uh, I just give this one very 
kind of just this one slide, one example of what kind of work my team and I are, are doing. Uh, and we are studying social robots as these kind of like uh, agents in the various areas of society, whether it's schools, customer service, factories, uh, elderly uh, care facilities, and so on. And of course, these are kind of bright, some of these are very sensitive contexts, and we very much have to go to study ethnographically, really go to these places and study what happens there and how could these kind of embodied agents such as social robots uh, fit into this context. So we don't should never assume that it's, it, it is a good solution, but we should study how how this kind of um, uh, how how this kind of uh, new technologies, intelligent so-called intelligent technologies, could help and inspire humans in in their in their tasks, in their lives, and in their work. So, uh, so uh, the, maybe the well, this is not yet the last point, but almost the last point I want to make here is that I mean there has been in the last thirty years or so, so this kind of a like movement towards human centered design of technology, and for the most part, it actually is already quite rooted in the in the kind of technology uh, development. But now with the era of AI, we are still in a very early stages of understanding how this human centered design can be done. So there is this very, very uh, interesting study by Young and others um, that sort of uh, outlined the sort of the, the actually some of the root causes or, or difficulties in, in, this, in this kind of design, design of this kind of systems, because it does differ um, quite significantly from from the design of the so-called traditional or non-AI-driven uh, 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 technology. So I just pick a couple of points here uh, because this, it is a long list. So there are lots of challenges. Uh, and uh, so, for example, that it's very hard to design something before we know and have our data. So so there is kind of link, linkage to this sort of data, data science part. It's very hard to prototype some of these um, uh, behavior system behaviors if we don't yet have the data, and and so it's it's very hard to test these things very early, which is usually exactly what should be done in in the in the design of of new technology solutions. Sometimes it's hard to design for the shared control between AI and the users. Uh, and this is also a very important one, difficult to anticipate. Uh, and some of the examples I showed uh, earlier, uh, it can be, can be sometimes very hard to anticipate this sort of un unpredictable AI behaviors. And accountability is another uh, problem. But there are indeed several kind of quite even big uh, challenges there, how, how we could make this, uh, this kind of design area human-centered. And what is actually the, the research design community uh, from human technology interaction is very heavily working on right now uh, is to develop this kind of transdisciplinary concepts and methods where technology and human fact factor experts could work uh, very kind of like tightly together in order to design human-centered AI solutions. And this is actually the, the final point I want to make here is this sort of like AI literacy. So in addition to looking at the sort of what the developers and the designers and researchers can do is also that in the, in the society, we uh, could and should actually kind of improve people's AI literacy to help them understand what A can and cannot uh, do. And they're actually really, this is an interesting resource. So if you are interested and are not familiar with this, this AI for K-12 is a nice nice uh, resource for this kind of like uh, explaining what, what AI can do and what is good for and what, uh, what it, it, its potential impact can be. So actually, that was my presentation. Here are my just my key messages. I hope I didn't spend too much time. Um, so again, just human users and other stakeholders should be involved in all stages. Uh, we need these uh, common methods and, and values, concepts to work together between data scientists, engineers, uh, the human factors uh, specialists. And uh, like the last point I made was this about this uh, improving the AI literal skills in the society. So I will stop sharing here and uh, thank you for listening. That's great, Kasa. Thank you. And we must have been listening to you earlier at QT because as of um, next year and fully into 2025, we're offering all of our students the opportunity to do human robot um, 
collaboration as part of a, a subject that you can take regardless of where you're studying at QUT and it's been oh. fantastic to create it and have different teams come together so that will be good and it'll be um, wonderful to um, circle back on some of those topics you mentioned particularly around trustworthy and the speed of development which I think we're seeing a lot of challenges in. So our next presenter today is Professor Janet Wiles who's a professor in human-centered computing at the University of Queensland. Her multidisciplinary team co-designs language technologies to support people living with dementia and their carers, new tools to enable Indigenous communities to develop their own speech recognition systems, and social robots for applications in health, education, and neuroscience. Her most recent research on human-centered AI focuses on how older Australians perceive and manage their digital identities. And Janet is a fellow of the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences, so we're equally pleased for you to be with us today. Over to you. All right, thank you very much. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, good. Um, so I um, I would like to follow up from what Kais has been saying and particularly get into, you know, what um, practical AI as it's embodied in robots might look like as we go through the world. I started by asking ChatGPT to list AI technology to support older people living with dementia at home. Um, and it came up with memory apps, smart homes, virtual reality, telehealth, wearable devices, social robots, and customized music. And I think it's really useful to think about that list and think about how many of those we're actually using in our own homes at the moment. So I want to take you through a pro um, one of the, the projects that we had and show you some examples from what we've learned as we go. So um, my background is computer science and cognitive science. I've done a fair bit of work from neuroscience through to social uh, interactions. And one of the things you, you see in brain dynamics particularly is the idea of a lot of things happening at multiple different timescales. So this goes from less than a millisecond, which is how you locate where you are in a room, right through to social moments, which are a tenth of a second, um, cognition, one or two seconds, right through to our social interactions with other people. And so bringing this idea of a complex systems focus into um, the way we think about robots, we've done quite a lot of work designing different robots that children can interact with in real time. And I think this is a really useful way of thinking about how to design robots that are going to be in um, uh, care homes, in our homes, um, in schools. What does it take to make a robot safe? So the image here is a safe high five robot. Um, the idea is to have something that a child can come in contact with for this particular robot. When the, the kids play games and when they win, they can high five the robot. They rather love this. Uh, the robot moves reasonably slowly, but the social interactions between the children and the robot can be as fast as a tenth of a second. So it's really interesting how you get that speed, which you don't tend to get in commercial robots if, if they're within uh, interaction distance of a, a child or a human. The other thing that's really interesting to think about here is just how simple this robot looks. This is actually, um, we worked on these robots for a number of years. There are, this is the OP or OFL design project, a whole series of different robots. We started thinking we would design something that was, um, you know, a fully fledged robot that could do everything we wanted. And we rapidly picked up on this point that Kaiser said that we need to have interactions um, cycles of design. So we started in the first six weeks, we actually had about 17 different robot designs. One of them there has uh, gloves on its hands because we had sensors in the hands so that if the kids touched it, we'd be able to detect it. Way too creepy. The kids would never touch the hands. Um, lots of different designs. Kids really liked interacting with some of the, the versions. This one's very, very simple but children would hang off it. There would be two or three kids around it at any one time. They'd kick the backboard. In one case, three children push the tablet through the back of the robot. It has to be safe for the children, even doing things like that, and also safe for the robot. Um, in this case, Kristen just picked it up, put it back together again, and the kids kept playing. So in some of these experiments, we showed that actually children do learn from robots and they learn from videos in a way that 20 years ago they didn't. But when we put the robots in the classroom, 
something interesting happens. Kids don't work one on one, but tutoring systems are designed one on one. So in this particular case, you've got four children at this station, but the tutoring system was designed to teach one at a time. So in some places, each child gets a turn. So you have four different turns. In other places, one child gets four turns and three kids watch on. Now, a teacher would regulate that, but the robot doesn't even know that it has four different children in its group. So there's a lot of things when you put robots into the real world where social dynamics makes a big difference. So robots in the classroom um, tend to be experimental except for STEM teachers who really love robots. So these are animates are um, puppets, robot puppets for preteens. So these were some, this is some work that Sarah Matthews when she was at uh, UQ was doing with children aged 10 or 11. She's now uh, working at QT, pleased to say. Um, and children in this build and design their own microcontrollers, program them and tell stories. So this is a little bit of robotics, a little bit of um, education. Kids get to understand how things break. Tech is always breaking. So they become tech detectives in their own worlds. So STEM teachers love robots. Almost no other teachers do because it takes so long to set them up. And actually, from a teaching point of view, um, it's much harder to do any sort of group learning and kids tend to learn in groups. So just summarizing Opie in the world, in the wild, there are a variety of different uh, insights we might have. One I think that is, is really important is that any technology interacting in real time in your personal space is inherently social. It can't fail to bring out your social interactions. The second one is this idea of the media is the message. This is an old phrase, it's more than 60 years old now. But when you look at this very simple robot, the robust, robust form invites the children to touch. This little boy loved the robot hands. He was sitting there for a long time before the robot even woke up so that he could play with it. And he just liked hanging onto it. Other kids would hang off the frame. They would peel back the black curtain, inspect it, and then put the curtain back in place. Um, the stance of the robot, the way its head is bent, invites sitting. The games in this one are individual, they're structured, they're predefined, and that's worth thinking about from a learning point of view. And the third insight here is the model of the children are actually incomplete, and anyone who's worked with robots in real social settings, there is one thing, well, there are several things that are missing here, but there's one thing in particular that's missing from this image. I don't know if you can guess what it is. If we look at this when the child is not actually doing one of the experiments, same child, same robot, but in the wild, there is almost never just one child interacting with the robot. So this one shows a warm up game and the, the robot is saying, do you have eyes? And then everybody joins in. So in this particular case, the warm up games aren't designed as one-on-one -on -one tutoring. They're design designed as social interactions. And to see technology as always interacting um, or helping others interact with other humans, it makes you rethink what your data actually should be and how you use your data in AI systems. Okay, so um, what do AI impact studies, and this comes back to um, Kaiser's human-centered AI questions, what does AI need to know about humans individually and socially? And there's a human-centered AI group that's been working together for um, close on three years now at UQ. And we actually think the model of the human that is used in technology is pretty well broken. We need better models. So the model here, very simple from psychology, social psychology, is looking at the needs of the human in terms of competence, relatedness, and autonomy. And these can be unpacked, but not just for the individual. We also need multi-level models of that for one individual or a conversation between two individuals, between people to people, social groups to social groups, or we might talk about um, an event over a period of time. So what you see here is a pyramid of metrics developed with Dan Angus, uh, when he was working at UQ, now at QT as well, uh, 
developing the Discursus, which is text analysis software for looking at the interactions initially within a single conversation, but then between individuals, between groups, um, and larger than that. So one of the things that I think we need is to be understanding better models of humans as social beings, individually in ourselves and within our groups. And then we need tools that enable us to reveal that and be able to predict what's going to happen as we design our AI systems. So the areas where um, large language models currently uh, are very effective is where facts don't matter. So entertainment, recommendation systems and sales, but when safety matters. So going into things like um, the digital identities, and we can talk more about this if people have questions, um, how do we, uh, how do we, represent ourselves online and how do we um, detect others online becomes um, an important point when we're so used to thinking in these concrete ways that we have with these embodied robots. And I think I'll finish there. Thank you, I think it's a great um, add-on. Um, and it's fascinating to watch the development of those robot designs as the, as the studies go on. Um, so our third speaker today is going to bring a slightly different view because I thought it was great that we had um, some of our uh, professors working in the field and pushing the envelopes in the field and then um, some of our areas that are experiencing some of that uh, dimension and, and sometimes not in a good way either. So um, I'm really pleased that um, Professor Sarah holland Fat has been able to join us, another fellow of the Queensland Academy of Arts and Science. And um, Sarah is a professor of poetry at QUT and an award-winning poet, editor, critic, and academic. The author of three books of poems, most recently The Jaguar, which won the 2023 Stella Prize and the Queensland Premier's Award for a work of state significance, and a book of essays, Fishing for Lightning, a collection of her columns on contemporary Australian poetry written for the Australian. She's the recipient of a Sydney Meyer Creative Fellowship the W.G. Walker Memorial Fulbright Scholarship, has had residences at Yaddo and McDowell colonies in the United States, and the Australian Council Literature Residency at the B.R. Whiting Studio in Rome, amongst many other things. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Rabina. And um, you'll notice from that bio, everyone, that one of my areas of expertise um, is, is not AI, but nonetheless, it's, it's an area in which I think writers are acutely concerned across a range of ethical issues. And so I wanted today to touch on a few things. I'd like to talk a little bit about implications for writing in journalism and, and job losses and the ways in which um, AI at times is supplanting kind of human expertise, but also uh, the kind of ethics of reporting through AI. Um, I'd then like to turn to a, an issue that really interests me as a poet, which is the question of artificial eloquence and whether AIs will ever write poems in the way that poets will. And I've conducted a very thorough set of interviews with ChatGPT in preparation for today. Um, I'm going to share with you some of its poetic attempts and some of my informal findings. Um, and then I'd like to talk to you at the end of uh, my presentation a little bit about the Books 3 data set, which some people will have seen in the news. Um, this is an enormous data set that has been used to train uh, some generative AIs. Uh, and there are really serious concerns because a lot of copyrighted materials, including uh, living authors books have been found within this data set. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about the ethics of that and the implications of that for writers. But um, just to sort of touch on, I suppose, the, the landscape for writing as a field. Um, in probably journalism is the area where we're seeing the, the fastest kind of job replacements. So in an Australian context, um, I was interested to see Michael Miller, the CEO of uh, News Corp, disclose that across its hyper-local mastheads, something in the order of 3,000 articles per week are being generated by AI already. Um, interestingly, those articles, they're mostly covering things like weather, fuel pricing, traffic updates, um, kind of repetitive forms of reportage, um, but they, they all formerly would have been uh, covered by human beings. Interestingly, I think in that instance, there is no attribution that this is AI generated content. Um, there's a sort of general uh, general kind of byline that just says hyperlocal. Um, the ABC is also using generative AI across its reporting, but mostly for transcription of audio and text to speech delivery. 
Um, internationally, we, we know that journalism is hemorrhaging jobs. Um, the German tabloid Bild recently uh, announced 200 job job cuts. That's the that's the sort of um, the most widely read newspaper across Europe. Um, and there's implications that AI may be taking some of those jobs. Equally, I saw I think this morning in the paper that the Washington Post is losing 250 jobs, which is quite an extraordinary number. So th there are opportunities, I think, for AI in that sort of general form of the most basic form of reportage. But I think there are also interesting ethical questions about authorship and attribution and concerns around accuracy of AI-generated content. So um, in probably the most egregious uh, example that I was able to dig up, which some people may remember from the news, um, the German weekly magazine Die Actuelle had to sack its editor and apologise to the family of Michael Schumacher after, after it ran a quote unquote interview um, with the Formula One legend who people will recall is has not been interviewed or heard from for many years due to a, his catastrophic, catastrophic skiing incident that had been entirely generated by AI but had been published. And so I think in the scheme of uh, public forms of writing like journalism, we're already seeing job losses and, and at times those forms of writing are probably indistinguishable from what human beings are able to produce. Um, but as, as a poet and a very analogue poet at that, you'll see I've got handwritten printed notes. <laughs> um, I, I'm interested in this question of uh, whether, whether um, generative AI will ever be able to write poems in the way that human poets can. And this is really not a new uh, issue. So the so computer scientists have been trying to get poets to write po uh, computers to write poems for decades. Um, it's it's sort of a question that's as old as will computers ever learn to beat humans at chess? Um, and many poets for many decades have been using forms of computer generated composition to write with computers. Um, algorithm generated poetry has been on the internet for a really long time. Many years ago, there was a website called Random Haiku Generator. Um, I'm fairly sure I had some students submit haikus through my poetry course that were, were generated in this way. Um, and so this is not new in the in this sort of scheme of creative writing, but I think the interesting thing about these generative AIs is that they give the end user a democratic kind of access to ask, to ask it to write very specific kinds of poems and to ask it about its compositional principles as well. And so I was curious, I think, um, from a poetic perspective, of course, my take would be that computers will never write poems in the way that human beings can in, for a range of reasons, partially because they don't have human experience to draw on, and that is that is the nature of poetry, um, but but also because, in a sense, they are trained on existing language, they're trained on existing ways of expression, and in order to write poems that are of the contemporary moment, poets today are always trying to push language forward from where it is, and so my sense is that no matter how sophisticated those models are, no matter how large the data set, no matter how much poetry is fed into the machine, um, there's always a sense that contemporary poets are working at an advance from what's been written or trying to push language forward. And so that question of how ChatGPT will learn to be genuinely inventive with language, not apply its existing meaning, but in fact, you know, um, create new forms of language or interpretation of experience that haven't been written, which is, I suppose, the objective of poets, um, is, is a kind of live question. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my interview. And Rabina, please, please um, yell out if I need to sort of speed up. Um, but I, I was curious to ask ChatGPT to write me some poems. And so I did. Um, it, it cleaves almost uniformly, and ChatGPT is obviously just one of many um, democratically accessible kind of forms of AI, but it cleaves almost uniformly to, to rhyme. It's very fixated on quatrains, which are four-line stanzas. It's almost impossible to get it to break out of these really basic kinds of forms that haven't been in use for century. It's uncomfortable uh, with slant rhyme. In, in fact, I suspect it can't it can't tell what is a slant rhyme. So a slant rhyme is a rhyme where the vowel or consonant are the same, but not both. A perfect rhyme is when both are the same. It's very comfortable with perfect rhymes. It has a lot of difficulty with imperfect rhymes. When I asked it about this, it said that was because it cannot hear. It can only um, interpret the sound of words using phonetics. So, I mean, I think in a sense, a range of the tools that poets use to compose visual and oral are not yet present in, in the current kind of AI. 
Um, it also has an enormous uh, preference for cliche and for inverted syntax, which is a sort of amateurish poetic way to get to a rhyme. You, you may remember this from writing poems in high school. When you're asked to, to have a rhyme at the end of the line, you end up sort of slightly warping the way you'd say something to, to land on that word. All of the poems it produced kind of demonstrated that. Um, I asked it for a list of poetic words, which I'd like to read to you because they were quite funny. These are the sort of words that I banned my students um, from using. So when I said, could you please give me a list of words that poets might use? It said ephemeral, zephyr, serene, ethereal, luminous, mellifluous, tranquil, resplendent, enchanting, radiant, reverie, halcyon, cascade, aegis, sonor sonorous, incandescent, petrichor and labyrinth, among many others all of which to my contemporary ear are incredibly archaic. So it's very interesting um, the, the kind of sense that ChatGPT has of language. I asked it to give me examples of strong metaphors and strong similes and to contrast those with weak metaphors and weak similes. The strongest metaphor it was able to, the, str the strongest simile it could provide me was her smile was as bright as the morning sun, um, which is the sort of thing I would dash out on a student essay and say cliche to. Um, it, it, it basically has a very confused sense of poetic language and meaning. When you actually probe it and ask it why it's chosen certain things, um, it has difficulty justifying them. And my sense is perhaps it's generating things based on patterns, algorithmically things that are repeated, ideas that are repeated are the ideas that it's able to kind of produce. Um, it also produced a number of really basic errors. And I know there's been reporting about um, chat GPT becoming dumber in its capacity to answer mathematical questions. I also was curious about whether or not this is the case, and I couldn't find any data on this, whether or not this is the case with its use of language as well. So it gave me incorrect examples of assonance. It gave me incorrect examples of consonance. Um, so it's not reliable, I think, even in the basic use of language in a way that I might have expected it to be, let alone in writing poetry. Um, I also asked it to write poems in the style of well-known poets, presuming that in this massive data sets, it would have access to them. When I asked it to write me a poem in the style of Emily Dickinson, who is an incredibly idiosyncratic poet, who you will all know, used lots of long dashes and really short lines, really kind of sharp poems. It wrote me rhyming doggerel, um, and I'll read you one little stanza of that. So in this realm of inner grace, in solitude, I find my way. So in this realm of inner grace, in Dickinson's style, my thoughts convey. That, that is chat GPT's attempt at sounding like Emily Dickinson. Um, when I asked it to write a poem so to mimic Dickinson's stylistic choices, so gave it more sort of specific prompts, such as her use of dashes, it responded with another revision that included the dashes, but still had a strange self-referential line about Emily Dickinson at the end. Um, it was unable to successfully write basic poetic forms, including the guzzle and the sonnet. Um, it got the sort of rhyme scheme correct, but the line arrangement wrong, didn't know what a volta was, all of which makes me feel quite quite safe as a poet in my career choice. I think it's a long time until chat GPT is quite coming for me yet. Um, and intriguingly, I just wanted to sort of throw this out there. While its writing skills are very limited, so too are its ways of conceiving of the function of literature and the value of offence in art. So when I asked it whether poets should have total artistic freedom, it gave me quite a conservative answer, saying that po poets have the duty not to offend. Um, and it also said poets should be aware of the potential for offence and willing to engage in respectful dialogue with readers who may have differing perspectives or reaction to their work and that poets should respect the dignity and feelings of their audience. Um, and when I pressed it to explain what might cause offence in a poem, it produced such a comprehensive list that it's impossible to imagine what else you might write a poem about. So it indicated that subjects for offence could include racial and ethnic identity, religion and belief systems, gender and sexuality, violence and trauma, sexuality and explicit content, political and ideological views, mental health and suffering, death and grief, and controversial historical events and personal confessions. So without that list, I'm not sure exactly what poets have left to write about, but it's interesting, I think, that, that it has attitudes towards art. Um, and that's that's an area that I'm kind of interested to, to continue to interview it as, as my sort of thinking on this comes, comes along. Um, but I just wanted to sort of close on this, this question really briefly of the ethics of, of the way that these um, data sets and responses are being generated. So 
The Atlantic had some really wonderful reporting. I'll pop a link in the chat um, when I finish just in a moment. Uh, by Sean Press, by sorry, by by journalist about this developer Sean Presser and his books three data set, um, and it transpired that this data set has scraped nearly two hundred thousand copyrighted eBooks by really celebrated Australian and international writers from the internet without consent to train its generative AI, including um, Meta's Llama, Bloomberg's Bloomberg GPT, and Eluthers GPTJ. Um, the data set includes 191,000 uh, ISBNs, including many of Australia's best known, best known authors, Peter Carey, Helen Garner, Tim Winton, Jane Harper, um, and so forth, as well as international authors, including Stephen King, John Grissom, Zadie Smith, Margaret Atwood, and so forth. Um, and so while the, the I think there's an ethical question there about the appropriation of copyrighted works from living authors, um, it's interesting that ChatGPT wasn't used uh, with works that are out of copyright, that it's somehow pilfered these um, these sort of copyrighted works, um, whose of, of authors whose livelihoods, I suppose, and intellectual property are both compromised. And I think there's been a lot of focus on the money um, kind of dimension of this. But I think there are also questions around um, the unique idiosyncratic nature of a writer's approach through language and what happens when that becomes subsumed into a data set remixed um, spat out in various ways. Um, I think there are sort of legitimate kind of quite specific concerns about the implications um, for a writer's style. Uh, and obviously there are quite concerns about what will happen when ChatGPT and other generative AIs start publishing books, flooding the market with inferior content, making it difficult for authors who already have significant difficulty making a living in Australia um, to, to create a living. Um, and I just want to close on by noting that, you know, the average um, income for Australian authors, the most recent statistic, is $18,200. It is a very difficult kind of way to make a living, including for really celebrated authors. And so I think there are really um, serious kind of ethical dimensions to these tools that otherwise are, are kind of a lot of fun that we're all enjoying playing with. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Rubina. That's great, Sarah. Thank you for all of those examples and obviously many other threads there to to follow on. Um, so you've heard from each of our speakers, so please feel free to pop any questions in the Q&A. Um, and to get that started, I'm gonna just ask a couple and we'll see how the questions come along. Um, so Kaiser, the first one to you, um, just focusing back on that sense of trustworthy and speed. So we hear a lot about the concerns about trust and the need for safeguards in the work that we're doing, um, but we're also, um, somewhat in a mode of the um, the move fast and break things mentality that you know often comes with IT development. So do you think there is a way that we can balance both these two things that are needed? Yeah, that's a very good question, Robina. Thanks. Um, well, there to some extent, yes. <laughs> I mean, of course, there needs to be. I mean, I think it's a lot about this training data that is available for any new application that is being developed. So if that training data is uh, high quality, and of course, that <laughs> depends on what it means. Uh, it means different things in different situations. But so I think there is and there should be some way of, of training and trying out those new AI forms in the early phase of the development. Of course, the, the, the trustworthiness is such a broad topic and also very multidimensional. And so to some extent, uh, I my guess is I don't have any any kind of research data to back this up, but I believe that the full kind of trustworthiness will only reveal itself when the actual system is in use and for a longer period of time. So I think this also applies to, for example, these large language models. I mean, of course, to some extent, it can do great things, very interesting things and inspiring things. But now what does it really mean to the society in different fields such as education? And now, I mean, it was I was super kind of like happy to learn about this poetry kind of um, uh, perspective, like uh, what does this really mean in the long run? And 
And again, what does trustworthiness mean, for example, in poetry? I mean, I, I it, it is very, very difficult to uh, question to answer in a very short terms, but I believe that there are good ways to sort of do some kind of early iterations and some kind of speed uh, related sort of like um, development activities. But uh, in, in many cases, we will only learn the actual kind of like phenomena in a little bit longer run. So yeah, there are some risks involved for sure. <laughs> Thanks. Indeed. And um, Janet, I guess your work in a, a number of the examples you gave us are dealing with quite vulnerable populations, young children, older, older people. And the Center for Automated Decision-Making in Society in its recent report to the federal government identified at least 10 existing legal frameworks that potentially would need to be updated in our brand new world. Um, and while that's no small task, we've then got a number of other bodies who are really saying we shouldn't be updating our current systems. We're going to have to think about whole new legal frameworks or regulatory frameworks to deal with um, AI advances. Um, how does that play into the work you're doing and how do you see how you can advance within that complex framework? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because I think the legal frameworks need to advance at the same time as the technology. You can't say, let's play catch up, the system's broken. The question is, how do you do it when the AI researchers don't have a legal background and the legal uh, the people who are writing the laws don't have an AI background. So you actually need multidisciplinary teams. And I think as, as Kaiser was saying, we really need a lot of co-design or participatory design where the people at the who are going to be impacted by systems are part of the entire design of the system. Um, so I guess the approach we would take in our work, working with, for example, working on a Florence project, which is looking at technology for older people living with dementia at home, we started with a, a concept of what we thought would be a good idea, a system that helps support them. We put together a team of uh, people who are living with dementia or, or carers, care partners of people living with dementia, and they hated the idea. And right at the beginning, this was thankfully right at the beginning of the project, we then pivoted the entire project, brought them on back on board as part of our team and started redesigning. They wanted an ecosystem of much simpler devices. They didn't want to have to use a computer. They wanted us to design some really simple technologies, which we've done. So bringing in people who are partners in the design, one of the things it does do is it means the AI you create uh, isn't always low hanging fruit. It's not always just one easy step forward from the data set, the, you know, the data set that Sarah was talking about. It's already online, why can't I use it? Well, there are a lot of reasons it doesn't have a lot of the information you might want. Um, so with people living with dementia, there's not a lot of data from them in the system. So there's this, there's a data deluge in some areas and there's a data desert in others. So I think some of the occupational therapists and others who are really keen on how do we think about that data desert? Um, so certainly vulnerable people, but also some of our communities, if you look at our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, there are very good reasons why they don't want their data recorded. So you might say you want to do better facial recognition. Can we get a lot of people with dark skin as well as light skin? And then you suddenly realize that nobody wants to volunteer because being part of the system hasn't been good for them in the past. So building in trust. So if they build the system for what they want to do with it, you might not need face recognition. You might not need to identify people like that. How do people currently identify themselves and how do you bring that into your systems rather than saying, how do I make someone look like they belong in my system? How can I build a system that works for where they are? It's a very different design philosophy. Um, it takes longer. There's that phrase, move fast and break things. And at the recent Indigenous Languages and Technology Conference, one of the um, speakers said, move slow and heal communities because moving fast breaks them. And I think it's, it's worthwhile rethinking the process, not just the output. Great, thank you. And we've got five 
questions and comments coming in now. So we'll we'll start to take them from our um, our group. Um, so from Daniel Angus, um, wonderful panel. Thanks all. The great examples by Sarah echoed many of the points raised by Emily Bender, Timnit Gebru, Angelina McMillan Major, and Margaret Mitchell on the notion of stochastic parrots that these large language models are good at pattern matching but fail to impress in higher level cognitive tasks and they have no underlying model of cognition. Are there any reflections on what the lack of a cognitive model means for the present generative AI moment? Who would like to take that one? I, I guess this is something that um, at the moment, the, the language, mo the fact that there's no correspondence with reality of any kind means that you have to have a situation where facts don't matter. So if it's entertainment, that's fine. If it's very, very low risk and you just need to guess, then a best guess might be fine. If you need it to correspond to a real disease someone has or you want to capture a real moment, a current moment, as Sarah was talking about, in a poetry sense, then the cognitive aspects of it really do matter. There are, but chat GPT and large language models are not the only AI models around. There are lots of different kinds. Um, some of the others are still being researched. It's just that they're not hitting the headlines. And so a lot of those are looking at how you create veridical statements rather than how you create likely, probabilistically likely statements. So in the first instance where people are using ChatGPT, you can use it as a, um, a creative idea, ideas generator, as a prompter, as a expand your way of doing things. But then a human has to do the, the veridical filter and just make the decisions. And that's where I think AI at the moment is being used really well. Great. Thank you. So, um, Sarah, we have a question for you. Um, so from Jean Moyle, thanks to the whole panel for helpful information and insights. Your overview was really great in highlighting shifts in the use of AI chat GPT in reporting of general information in journalism, which might be helpful versus the expressive nuance needed in creative expression. Do you know of any studies or research into how the audience feels about poetry or writing that is generated by AI versus humans? What about critics? Yeah, that's a good question, Jean. I mean, um, I think... Critics, that, that question has been sort of passed and surpassed in, in criticism in that found poetry, which in a way is almost a sort of form of generative AI poetry or poetry that's not authored by the poet is a very well-established kind of form in poetry that's been around for just about a century. So that idea of human authorship or individual authorship being coupled with the creative work has been really firmly, I think, decoupled for quite some time in criticism. So, I mean, I'm thinking of um, that there's a poet called Kenneth Goldsmith, whose entire work he calls, his body of work, he calls it uncreative writing, um, where he hasn't written a single word of all of his books. He has found all of the work and called it poetry. So he's got a book um, called American Deaths and Disasters, in which the it, it, all of the sort of poems are just narration from television deaths and disasters. So the death of Michael Jackson, 9-11, things like this, the way in which TV um, sort of reporters have spoken about those broken events, he's transcribed that and called that poetry. And so that, that I think, um, criti critics are not particularly concerned with the idea that the poet hasn't written it. Um, the question of whether it convinces an audience is, is an area where there is some scholarship that I've read um, conflicting. So I think it depends on who the audience is and what kind of poetry they're expecting. If they're expecting basic poetry, like doggerel, rhyming poetry, in which the poet doesn't sound like a practicing poet, but just does this pass as poetry. Um, there has been some research to suggest that audiences can't differentiate that. Um, I think if you're showing a poet, there's absolutely no question in my mind um, when I'm reading a chat GPT poem versus a poet written by a practicing poet that these are these are very different um, forms of writing and they're, they're very easily distinguishable. So I would say um, both the literature, but my own just my own perspective as a reader and um, sort of scholar of poetry, uh, it depends on the expertise level of the audience of, of who the audience is, of who the reader is, as to whether these things are distinguishable or not. Thank you. And as we do have questions coming fast and furious, so I'm going to flip between the screens a little bit. Um, so we have um, one given. We do actually have 
all um, academics on our panel, although each are engaging with the sectors in many ways. Um, so um, from Bernadette, um, thanks again for a thoughtful and provocative discussion. What do you think the role of academics is to educate public servants who are preparing policies and legislation? And uh, could, should we be doing that on an individual level, not just at centre level responses to submissions and things? Would, would a community of practice um, to support this be, be a, a good idea? Anyone want to go first? I'll just say yeah. something really briefly on that, which is that um, I think there already is significant industry kind of response from, from Australian writers to this news about the data set. So um, I just refer everyone, it's very interesting to read if you're curious, the Australian Society of Authors and other, um, other kind of writing organisations have already written kind of collective responses intended to inform policymakers in this area and the government is going to have to scramble I think to respond quite um, quite quickly in terms of the the intellectual property and copyright issues for writers around the use of their 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 works um, so yeah do have a read of that statement I'll, I'll pop a link to it in the chat and we have a number of questions around how can people best keep up with the trends and know what are authoritative sources on things. Um, and Kaiser, I might get you to quickly give us a, an answer there, but I wonder also through the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences website, we might be able to start collecting a range of sources as well. And given we have so many fellows working in this area, we might be able to help with that. So Kaiser, just to you. Yeah. Uh, that's of course so that's also a very very kind of hard question and I guess I can know I maybe would know better in the European kind of uh, landscape so so if we think of European Union for example there are these kind of like uh, 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 kind of uh, regulations and uh, quite good resources that are obviously considered very trustworthy if we go to the European Commission you can you can kind of trust that that they would really offer a kind of like a well thought uh, uh, information and principles so that would be at least what I would in in Europe what I would do I don't know what would be the the similar or is there anything similar in in Australia and of course I think at least in in uh, Finland I think there are different ministries are uh, ministry of uh, that takes care of the digital affairs they would be the ones who would certainly certainly be the the kind of like the most reliable resources but I would also like to maybe just to briefly comment Bernadette's uh, question about the sort of what would be our responsibilities or at least, well, of course, uh, we can all choose partly our responsibilities, but at least this sort of AI literacy or a general understanding of what AI can and cannot do. I think that is really something that we as academics can, of course, share. Of course, again, there can be other bodies who are more have more resources of actually doing that. And at least in our case, when we work together with companies and and other organizations, it sort of comes naturally in those collaborations. But of course, then that's not necessarily very systematic. So if we want to have a systematic sort of education of our our society, then probably needs to be some other uh, instance than the university, at least and on the on this sort of individual level. So. But maybe others want to comment, and I realize that we only have two minutes left. Janet, did you want to add anything there? So I would say we, we need these conversations at every level. One of the local schools had uh, children aged uh, 12 to 17 studying AI issues, and they just invited me from the local university to answer questions. So it was just an online Zoom, but these are kids as young as 12 asking the most phenomenal questions. And then you've got people from government who say, you know, can I just talk to you for a moment? And you just fill them in on some questions. So I think being open to conversations at every level individually, but also things like these panels, um, I, I, I think we need this conversation right throughout our societies in every form and in every mode we can do it. So in person interactions, um, in study groups, and also the kinds of things that you know Dan was talking about uh, in his comments through our um, our centres of excellence as well. Great, thank you. Well, obviously, lots more work for the Queensland Academy of Arts and Sciences to do and to bring our groups together. And we will find a way 
to ensure that we can spread more resources amongst the group. But we are unfortunately out of time. It's been a fascinating panel. Thank you to Kaiser, Janet and Sarah for joining us today. And um, for Becky and, and Tim sitting behind the scenes there, making sure that we um, also keep on track. And Amara and Nazim from my office has also been really helpful in pulling it together. So I hope you've enjoyed this session. It will be posted on the sites, as we mentioned at the start. And thank you again. And uh, I'm sure there'll be an update soon on the next panel for your attention. Thank you. Bye.